What about the diplomats? The question was, what about the diplomats? How many of you heard about the Cuban and Chinese diplomats that had traumatic brain injury? Right? Okay, then you've heard the story. And you saw that even the New York Times reported that doctors had independently examined these people and said that they had traumatic brain injury. I was horrified to see a New York Times magazine story that tried to make these people all out to be mentally ill, that they'd all become hysterical and decided that they were damaged because they shared fear of this issue. It was a real disservice to those people, but it was a brilliant hatchet job on the behalf of this industry. This is the kind of thing that they do. And I hope that the poor souls who are suffering from this in the embassies um, will survive and do okay, but there's no question that the most likely explanation for what happened to the diplomats is that they were targeted with some kind of a microwave weapon like the one I showed you earlier this evening, a more subtle form of it. Because microwaves can go through walls, 5G doesn't go through them as well. So remember, we have different forms of microwave radiation. And microwave radiation of 3G and 4G could certainly be involved in causing that problem. And I think it's a disservice to the people who suffered to allow the issue to be handled as though it's a hysteria. There's no, there's no evidence to support that. They had pathologically confirmed MRIs showing traumatic brain injury, like what you get with a post-concussion syndrome, which can be very grave, as some of you know. Um, I have a question, a couple questions. Um, first, is uh, with city councils um, passing regulations against cell towers 5G, how do we get people before them that will testify as to the dangers because they have to hear, you know, professional things? The other question I have, oh, is uh, well, what I'm seeing throughout that comment is I'm seeing throughout Asheville they're putting up. Um, street lights all over the place. Like, yeah, it's going up all over the place in a regular fashion throughout the whole of Buncombe County without the need for lighting. Um, the other question is personal. I was, uh, I had to leave my house suddenly because the doctors ordered me out of my house because a, a, a street light went outside of my house and I collapsed. So I'm looking for a place currently to live, but I'm aware that cell towers can go up. I've become hyperelectric sensitive. Cell towers can go up at any time, anywhere. How can I um, understand what to do and where to move? And then um, I'm wondering if you can make the PDFs uh, available at this so it can get uh, the research um, of what's shown on there, the uh, slides. Thank you. I, I want to introduce someone who's been working on exactly this problem of creating a white zone in a safe space. Um, why don't you go ahead? I'm surprised. Thank you for inviting me up here. I'm Diana Schultz, and I'm a certified building biologist. I've been working for over 10 years, traveling all over the United States with professional meters and equipment to measure these fields. Um, so the question was, it, did you want me to address the question that she had? Could you repeat it again, what your specific question was? She wants to find a place to go, to live. That place to live when right. cell towers are going up all the time. Right. How do I find a safe place to live? So in the past six months, I've had to tell 10 different families to move because there weren't any mitigations that we could perform on their homes that would have helped them. Most of the time, we're trying to eliminate the sources or distance ourselves from them, but then we go to shielding if we have to. But some of these things are coming from all directions. We're, we're, we've got magnetic fields coming from power lines as well. And so we evaluate a property to be able to tell you know what needs to be done and make those recommendations. So actually, the reason I drove up here from Orlando today to be here is because I am looking at property in the Asheville area and I want to see if there are some areas that might be workable to create a white zone. A white zone is a term that was coined in France 
and they have areas where, at least I know one, maybe two areas, Dever may have some more information about that, but basically there are areas that don't have any cell towers or any radio frequencies. Uh, they're safe zones for people to go that can walk outside without any shielding and, and be able to live a normal life. So the closest thing we have to that in the United States is uh, Green Bank, West Virginia, where we have the location of our National Radio Observatory where they have a 100 square mile free RF free zone. And people are migrating there, but there's nothing else there but that, and it's very remote. So I have been looking around. I know there are areas even close to, to the urban areas that just behind a hill you can get out of these zones. So if you want to talk to me about this afterward, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about what we do. And uh, if anybody has any feedback on safer areas, I'm all ears. Okay. Do you have a website? Yes. You can go to the International Institute for Building Biology and Ecology, which the website is buildingbiology.net. And you can find an expert. I'm listed there, Diana Schultz. And there are many others that are listed there uh, so that you, know, you can see people around the United States that are doing this work. <coughs> Diana, I think the question was, do you have a website for this project yet? And I think the answer is not yet. No, not for this project that I'm looking at right now. But uh, stay tuned, OK? All right. And, and I, want, I think that I, I'm sure that this woman here is not the only person with that question. And I've, I will tell you that at every talk I give, people want to know, where's a safe place? And how do we create a safe place? And I would say, <clears throat> for the short run, there are people who are so ill by the exposures that they've got to find this place now, some place to retreat to. But for the long run, it's not, it should not be your job to find a safe space. We have got to make this society safer for everybody. And the idea um, that it's safe as it is now is preposterous. You've got children. They're in school. They're being given computers by teachers who are ignorant about what this means for their brains, as well as, if I may say, for their souls. Because children of all ages learn better with books and papers and pencils. And that has now been demonstrated for most forms of learning, whether it's in law school, by the way, where studies were done and um, published in the, uh, I think, uh, Harvard Business Review, showing that students who took notes on the computer versus those who wrote by hand and then rewrote them and then retyped them, which is the old-fashioned way that I did it way back when, they learn better than those who think they've got the notes and then it's somehow the level of learning is not as deep or intense. And that's been established, I think, uh, repeatedly. So you really have to start, you have to work with your school district and of course you want your children to be digital citizens and you want them to know how to use computers. It's not a question of no computers, it's a question of moderation, as it is with most things, and age appropriate things. Is it appropriate to give a child in kindergarten a computer, an iPad? No, it's not. Now, can they use it once in a while to talk to grandma? Since I'm a grandma, of course they can. No, once in a while. But that doesn't mean every day. That doesn't mean it's the go-to play thing when you have downtime at school. And there should be groups of parents who are informed enough to work with the schools to make that happen. And again, you want to be you want to look at the data that we have and recognize that a lot of the well-meaning people, I'm not suggesting that the people who are blanketing our children with technology in schools are evil, they're just uninformed. And we need to do, we need to do a better job of informing them of what to do right by them. We need to understand, they need to understand blue light. And it's not just a question of nighttime. You don't want to have too much exposure to any of these things. There's a question right here. That was advice for bringing professional opinion into the Oh, sure. Here. Well, you have some professionals here in building biology. You do. And they will make themselves known to you. There are people who are getting certified every day, right, Marianne? Right? Um, and that's, that's one profession you can rely on. I am sure you have physicians here who could be persuaded 
to do this. But you will ha and I'm happy to share all of our materials that are on our website at ehtrust.org with any professional that wants to use them because we have done many, many presentations to many, many city councils. I'm reluctant to take on any more, but I certainly have done many by Skype uh, in many countries as well as different cities. And if worst case scenario is that we could provide something to you, but there's a lot of material online uh, this lecture will be available. Investigate Europe is a good place to start. That little short piece um, where you see that the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection is a closed club, and mostly a closed boys club, by the way, but you know, it does not represent a complete neutral group when it comes to this opinion on what to do. So that's where I would start. And I think that uh, there are some people at UNC Chapel Hill that could be involved as well. Okay. Um, could you tell us a little more about exactly how 5G works, not the technology, but more how it's being delivered? Because we're hearing about the satellites, and then we're hearing about local antennas that will be in buildings and highways. And I think, and I'm also curious of what I've been seeing um, on these light poles are 5G. They, they look like chandeliers with uh, yeah. several discs hanging yeah. from a ring. Yeah. yeah. So, so, can you explain how the satellites and the local antennas work together and how that actually ends up in your devices? Um, the, the short answer is no. I can't explain it in any detail, but here's what I can tell you, okay? Um, 5G has up to a thousand simultaneously operating MIMOs, multiplex in, multiplex out antennas. That means they have 1,000 antennas that can simultaneously send and receive at the same time, right? So it's, therefore, it's much faster than what we have now with 4G, which is maybe 10 antennas of that sort. And they're not, and, and they don't send and, and receive at the same time. So that's the core of it. What I can tell you, and what different reports for the European Parliament have said is, 5G is, we don't, nobody who's building it knows exactly how it's going to work. That's the truth. In America, we have the attitude, if we're gonna build it and figure it out. And they're figuring it out on the backbone of public utilities and these phony street lamps that she talked about. And nobody really knows what it's, what, how it's going to work. The concept is that it's going to allow you to connect autonomous vehicles, which already exist, right? You've heard that we've been testing them for, for, for quite some time. But it's going to make more of them possible to operate at the same time. I don't think, I don't know, not, not, not by me. Because in, within the car itself, Behind the driver's seat, there'll be 38 of these simultaneously operating antennas. Well, what's going to happen to the person there? Well, just like you saw with the Ray machine, you know, the uh, active crowd denial machine, it's going to have beam forming. And beam forming means that you're going to have a very powerful beam. It's going to go between you, your device, and this antenna. And there are a lot of people in this industry who are very concerned about what that means for exposure to trees, bees, and the rest of us. And nobody really has figured it out. So the reason I can't answer the question is because the people building it can't fully answer it. They can tell you, in order for it to work, because the high, it's high frequency, it does not go far. So you need to have them about every 100 to 200 yards. What? Every 100 to 200 yards, you're going to have an antenna. These phony street lamps are going to go up, and in more tony neighborhoods, they're going to look nice, and in poorer neighborhoods, they're going to look like the, the you know, bunch of equipment like small refrigerators about to fall down on you. And by the way, they can. And if, if a car or a vehicle hits them, they can fall down, and they can hurt people as a consequence as well. So, so those are fed by the satellites? 
Is that the satellites actually go to, as far as I understand it, and if somebody else here wants to jump in, I'd welcome it. They go to the tower, and then the, uh, to a to a tower that, and then steps it down. Okay, um, and because the satellites are, you know, 500 watts, they're very very powerful. But by the time it gets down here, it's not as powerful. The power for the um, the local 5G with the um, goes from five gigawatts to up to 100 gigawatts. The, the problem there I'm concerned about is that you, they can ramp up. The power from it can be quite high. And I don't think anybody knows exactly how that's going to work. And it's a concentrated beam. So if you're in the middle of that between two devices, a, a, a tower and two devices. So the towers, the big towers, go to the smaller antennas and the smaller antennas. So it's just a distribution network. That's right. That's right. So there's one, a new one, just uh, between, right up the road, between exit 23 and 24, and it's directly over the highway. So you drive right under it. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and so your, any individual exposure will be trivial. But what if you happen to be working there? Or what if you're, you know, and, and in the urban environment, there will be people who are living and hanging out in, in these places. Now, Singapore is interesting because they are not planning to give 5G to consumers. 5G in Singapore is going to be for military, medical, hospital, police, and fire. That's, I think, appropriate. And they're all wired. Wire it to the fire station. Because the firemen are refusing to have wireless on the stations, right? And there's been reports from Klinghart and others about damage to their brains of those who've had the wireless. Make it wired. That's our financial systems right now. You cannot go to a big bank that isn't using a wired system because it's not secure for cybersecurity purposes. So wired is safer, faster, and more secure. And that's what we need. We need safe G. SafeG, which is a new, newly launched website, will provide information about how to make it wired to and through the premises. So in this university, instead of this wireless stuff, you want it wired. I have a system of cords which they weren't able to use, but I brought it with my computer. Because you can wire things. They will work faster and people will be It'll be much harder to hack it. So I would think from national security point of view alone, we ought to be moving in that direction. And if we had more of an informed conversation, maybe more people would be agreeing. There's a question here in the back and then right up here. Just curious, um, with the wired system, why, why we wouldn't go to that? If there's so many advantages, is that a lot more expensive? It can be more expensive. It depends on, like, in, in some of the higher end uh, residences where I live, they have put conduit under it. So when you have already put conduit, which is basically a hollow thing, then you can run whatever you want in terms of cabling. And you know, that's, that is in fact the way to go. If you don't have conduit, then you've gonna have to dig up the ground and, and put it in. And yes, that can be more expensive. But I think it's gonna be really expensive when we have massive epidemics of certain types of disease that we're going to have if we continue on this path. Yes? I was here uh, listening to a lecture on glyphosate and um, the guy went off topic saying, and so I was wondering if you can confirm this stats that he gave since you had some of your slides up there. He said that right now 30% of male men on our planet are uh, uh, sterile and 25% of females are and it's a little known fact and he said that any biological species when they hit 50% which he's predicting that will hit like in like 2050 uh, then that species dies. Wow. <laughs> well here's what I can tell you. I, I am familiar with data on the decline in sperm count, sperm quality and sperm count all over the world and I know because um, I've studied this for a while, there are many different factors that explain this, one of which is glyphosate, one of which is electromagnetic fields, others of which are exposure to certain other pesticides, heavy metals, as well as other environmental pollutants. Um, all of those things can 
contribute to a decline in male fertility. And we are seeing this worldwide, so he's correct. I don't know those numbers. That doesn't mean he's not correct. I'm just not familiar with them. What I do know is this. One in five couples that wants to conceive cannot. So the rate of infertility among married couples is 20%. That's pretty high, right? And that might be, um, and that is relevant. And we need to figure out better what's causing that. In the back, could you shout and shout? Sorry, just before you change, like the, the chem you had a slide that said the chemicals that are in your system can interact with the EMF. Could, it was related to that question. Could you elaborate on that? Okay. To, the question is to elaborate on the relationship between chemicals and EMF. Sure. Electromagnetic fields weaken membranes. Every cell in your body has a membrane. You remember the slide I showed of the test testicular cells? There's the ones that are all nice lined up with nice barriers like this. And then the ones that were exposed to electromagnetic fields are kind of like they've lost the membranes. When your membranes are weakened, then any chemical within the body can be more easily absorbed inside the cell. It's very basic like that. And what we know um, is that in medicine there are some applications of electromagnetic fields. Um, there's an Israeli company that I can't remember the name of that is using some devices to enhance the delivery of chemotherapy, which, which makes sense. I know that there are other companies that are using other forms of electromagnetic fields. In fact, there are so many companies, there's a field called electroceuticals. Electroceuticals are medical devices that use electricity to heal people. And these can be used to heal for traumatic brain injury. They have been shown to do that. But the idea, in medicine we know, that anything that is used as a drug can be harmful. Aspirin can kill you and can kill some people. You know, bleeding, they can bleed to death from an ulcer induced by aspirin. So we need to understand if it has biological effects and can be used as a drug, how dare we assume it can have no effect on everybody else? It flies in the face of everything we know scientifically. Um, there's a couple more in the back, right? What do you think about some of these products like Defender Shield and others to protect us? I, I am not able to evaluate products. Um, I don't, I've been asked repeatedly to endorse products. To, to, it's, all I can tell you is that some things do work and most don't. That's what I can tell you. Most don't and they make people feel better because they use them. And I just think that the most important advice I can give you is four words. Distance is your friend. Keep things off your body, out of your bedroom, and reduce your exposures. Distance is your friend. And what bothers me about some of these devices is that people will use them and then think that they can put the phone right here or in their pocket and everything's fine. And I don't know of any device that makes it possible to do that. There may be some. I'm not saying there is none. I'm simply saying that I don't know and I think it shouldn't be my job to find out. I think that should be the job of industry, and they should be making cases that are safer. They should be making software that is better, designed to be better. And I'll give you one example. You've heard about Huawei, the Chinese company, because it made the news because of the uh, po political issues relating to security for 5G. But what you don't know is that Huawei was the first company in the world to make a baby safe router. Now, what did that mean? And they got some heat from other companies in China. Um, my husband and I teach in China, so I know a little bit about what's going on there, not a whole lot. The baby safe router went to sleep whenever it wasn't needed and only woke up when it was called to wake up and worked at the lowest level possible. Now, why shouldn't all routers do that? Do you really need a router on 24-7? I mean, come on. 
That should be the standard, right? And that's why Huawei is such a threat to American businesses, because American businesses think this is even like a greenhouse gas climate issue. If all our wireless devices went to sleep all the time, and we didn't have to put them on airplane mode, and we didn't have to turn them off, if that was the default mode, we'd be saving a lot of electricity. We'd be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We'd be reducing our footprint. Yeah. I notice um, pretty frequently I'm working, and then I hear like this honking sound, and I see a squadron of Canadian geese and like they're going like in weird directions, like they're going east and then maybe a few days later I hear them again and they're going south and then maybe a week or two later I hear them again and they're going another direction, northeast or something. And um, I was just, you know, concerned about that and wondering is it satellites that's doing that? Could it be cell towers or what is going on with them? Unfortunately, the answer to strange patterns of migrating animals is all of the above. That's the answer. And I, first of all, there aren't that many satellites up yet. So I think we, uh, if that's unlikely, but you know, I, again, I, I don't know. And I, there's a lot I don't know. And, um, about, and I've only been working on this for about a decade. And it gets more, it gets more complicated. And the complexity has become a kind of shield. And most people say, oh, I can't deal with this, you know? And you all know you're here and because you're concerned and you all have family members who think you're crazy or don't know what you're talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Right, and everybody, so I wanna reach them. I wanna figure out how do we get them to understand this is real, this is a big deal. Your world is going to be totally changed and you won't be able to do anything about it if we, t if we completely blanket our countryside with these exposures. So again, all we can do, we still live in a democracy. You know, it's not fully for sale, although it is for sale. And you have to work with your local politicians. This is a grassroots activity. And I know Living Web Farms is all about grass and roots. And I was very impressed with what they're doing with free range animals and using grass to basically renovate and restore uh, the land and protect it. So I hope that they will take some of that grass and use it to help on this issue. This is a complicated issue, it really is. We're not opposed to technology. I'm not anti-technology. I'm just pro-health. And I don't think the two have to be uh, completely you know, incompatible, although they're often framed as though you're opposed to development. No, I think development's great, so long as it's healthy and sustainable. And we've got to figure out how to make that happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, can I just uh, say something real quick about Stop 5G Asheville? Please do. Okay. So, um, you have a sign up sheet here, right? Yes, we, we have a sign up sheet in the back if you're interested in getting involved. And I just wanted to ask everybody who's here who's involved with Stop 5G Asheville to please stand up. And so. Why don't you, <laughs> you come up here so the light is better on you? Okay. And why don't you say that again? Because the other YouTube channel, that first time. Introduce yourself. Okay. Your name. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Denise Mewborn and I'm with Stop 5G Asheville and I was just asking everybody here to um, stand up who's involved with Stop 5G Asheville. So if you're not involved, please look around. Um, we're all here and excited to talk to people in Asheville who are interested in getting involved with um, stopping the 5G rollout. When is your next area. meeting or what is your next activity? <laughs> <laughs> Our, our next meeting will be Wednesday, um, July 3rd, and um, Where? it will be in East Asheville, and we have a Facebook group called Stop 5G Asheville. Um, please get connected. Um, talk to any of us, you know, after this is over, and we'll be happy to hook you up. Sign up back there. And um, we have action teams. Um, we right now have a team that's you guys can sit down if you want. <laughs> we, we have a team that's working on educational materials. 
Um, we have um, a, a goal to, um, uh, to go to the Asheville City Council to try and um, get a resolution passed against 5G and possibly to get a similar ordinance that Berkeley did um, with the right to know um, cell phone ordinance. We also have an outreach team and we have a lot of fun. So we'd love to see you all. And, and do you have a program to um, try to work with any of the lawsuits that are underway, like the in, that is pending in the Ninth Circuit, where more than 100 different cities have sued to ask the FCC to stop the streamlining of 5G? A hundred different cities. So it's not like you are all alone. You need to know that there's a lot going on now. And it's late in the game, and yes, billions and billions of dollars have been invested in this, so my view is make it wired to and through, and make it an option rather than a requirement, right? Yeah, we have um, our, our educational materials team also involves a research component, and we are actively researching right now resolutions that different cities have done to come up with a comprehensive strategy of how we want to talk to our own city council. Um, thank you. And, and I have a, a question, too, that I want to ask. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask about the 1996 Telecom Act, which says that we cannot sue the telecom industry based on health impacts, which I think is outrageous and really you know, how is that even possible that that got passed? And, and to think that they knew that there was harm back in 1996. Anyway, <laughs> so, what I, so what my question is, um, do you, have you spoken with anybody who's got any kind of good strategies about how we can challenge that law and overturn it? Is there any kind of upswelling of interest around the country in overturning that law? So that's my okay. question. And the answer is yes. There are some people who are deeply concerned uh, about challenging it uh, in different ways. And we, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, mounted, I think, uh, has mounted, I think, an effective challenge. Uh, others are being developed in other uh, cities that I think may, may be successful. But it is, think about this. Um, most people did not have cell phones in 1996 and coverage for cell phones was very spotty and the reason was there were not that many towers so what the act did was to pave the way to put up towers in the country without objection but at the time most towers were not being located in dense residential areas that's changed now and 5g is a game changer because there's no way to have 5G without having towers right in your face, without having antennas close by to people. And that's why there's so much uh, opposition, but it's late in the game. And we're going to have to figure out strategies that will be effective. But as I said earlier today, Margaret Mead pointed out, never underestimate what a small but determined group of people can do to change the world because that's the only thing that ever does. Right here, Dr. Davis. Yes. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. First of all, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, second of all, if you listen to Dr. Klinghart and a lot of other doctors, they talk about this perfect storm coming because we've got glyphosate, which, was a, which is a, um, a metal chelator and that goes into your body. And then you've got this, all this metal in your body, and then you've got the microwaves co coming there, and it's, it acts as an antenna to the microwaves, essentially. So who knows what's gonna happen to the whole human race. So, you know, when we talk about all of this, a lot of the times it's focused on kids because they are the most sensitive. I'd like to see it more focused, or not more focused, but also focused on adults, because none of us are immune to this. I mean, we are all affected. There, we're, we're all 
we've all got um, heavy metals in us, so we're, so we're all affected. And I think the other thing is, is that we're not looking at the economics of what this actually does to each family. If it's affecting the, the uh, parents or the older people that we're not really, um, we're not talking about as much, I mean, that really affects the, the economics of the whole family, the kids and the, and the, the whole family. So, thank you. I think that you're, you're right. You're right. And we, um, metal toxicity is, is a problem in and of itself. The interactions between metal and glyphosate and electric, it, it is. I mean, Dr. Klinghart is correct. It can be a perfect storm in a lot of people. And so you do need to take steps to reduce your exposures uh, where you can. And in terms of what you eat, it's, it's, it is important, but it's not enough. You can eat as much healthy food as you want, but if you're, if you're in the midst of uh, getting a beam-forming antenna coming right down on you, that's not gonna help a whole lot. Although it will help you recover, because it's like melatonin will. Yes, ma'am. Are, are the smart meters as harmful as cell phones and are wireless um, phones as bad as cell phones? And the short answer is it depends, okay? But generally, smart meters can, can have peaks and bursts that have been shown to be very damaging. And so, um, it's a, again, it's a complicated issue because you may have a smart meter that is doing very little, but you might have a repeater meter or a collector meter, which it can be sending bursts re repeatedly and therefore be a problem. Cordless phones are small base stations in your home. I do not recommend them, period. Are now, they, the they, no, because usually you don't carry them in your pocket. But they can, they can be. So again, the devil is in the details. Distance is your friend. Now, in Switzerland, they have what they call the eco decked cordless phone. Again, it turns itself off and only wakes up when it's needed. We don't have that here unless the public demands it. Uh, I ordered one from Switzerland for my daughter when she was pregnant. Um, so you can get them. You can, but it, you know, but why should it be so difficult? Now maybe that's changed because that was four years ago. So are you saying that some smart meters that put collectors on some people's houses and they regular? You don't know what you're getting. That is correct. Do you want to, anybody here want to add to that? I just want to make a, a brief comment. There is an opt-out program for smart meters in North Carolina it now. It costs $17 a month extra and $170 setup fee. That's if you don't have the medical opt-out. Yeah. So it's difficult to find a doctor who is willing to um, do the opt-out, but they are possible. If you go to our website, Safe Tech Kids NC. Safe Tech um, Kids. Safe Marianne, Tech Kids Marianne, NC. Marianne, take a second and explain this a little slower because it, I think sure. it's important. So or it's a medical opt-out. Right, it's a medical opt-out. North Carolina is the only state in the country to have a medical opt-out, but it means that an MD has to sign this form and actually notarize it. So there are very few physicians that are um, at taking new patients for it, but what we found is that there are a number of family practice doctors who will do it for their own patients. Um, if you go to our website, safetechkidsnc.org, go to the blog there's a blog about smart meters and it tells you the steps to take to opt out and it also gives some instructions for how to shield a meter if you have a regular meter using foil so it's you have to like what if you don't have any symptoms could you just lie and say yeah. you do, so yeah. you get the opt out there's another you know way. as dr davis has said this is this is about a lot of different exposures, right? We're getting bombarded with many different things at one time. So unfortunately, the smart meters work on two frequencies simultaneously, and having exposure to those intense two frequencies 24-7, even if it's for little, it, it's, it's a cumulative effect. So you may not have any symptoms now. So they could still give you the opt-out form. Even you if just have to get a doctor that, that understands this issue and is willing to do it. And I, I have two meters, so my home and my 
garden where I'm eight, ten hours a day, and I had to redo the whole thing because you have to have a notarized physician's authorization statement for each meter, even though both accounts are in my name. Yes. So, yeah. so if your family doctor doesn't do it, Royce Bailey, um, who runs um, Park Ridge Integrative Medicine in oh. Fletcher, um, but behind the hospital, he and, will and take on. Dr. Lee is she does not take anybody anymore. It wow. became too Did chaotic. She, yeah, it was too chaotic for her. So, um, John Wilson from um, Great Smokies Medical Center has always done that for his patients, <coughs> but it's a, you know the initial visit is five hundred dollars or something. So, um, so anyway, Dr. Royce Bailey will take new patients. They have a notary that comes once or once every week or two from the hospital. And what's, what's Jim Biddle is also doing it for his patients. Good. Jim Biddle. 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 And right. it's all due by June 30th. Yeah. Like according to the Duke executives, this is supposed to be ongoing, but they're putting different, um, they're putting different dates on people's letters. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a team that's going to be meeting with Duke Energy and the Department of Health and Human Services um, in the middle of July. And so what we're trying to make sure that they have is information if people are having trouble with their opt-out meters is to provide us with comments. You can send comments to me at, um, at the Safe Tech Kids NC website and I can get those. Safe Tech Kids NC. Royce Bailey, what's his business name again? Royce Bailey, Dr. Royce Bailey. Yeah, I thought you said he was in the group. It's, um, it's Park Ridge Integrative Medicine. He's their primary, he's their primary guy. What about non-duty facilities? Like French broad electric. We're hearing that those are more difficult to get the opt out um, for. So, you probably have to pay for those. Yes, probably so. I don't want to take a minute. Let's, um, let's do those conversations afterward. Yes. Um, clearly, we have a lot of resources in the room between uh, Safe Tech Kids and Stop 5G. Um, I think Dr. Davis at this point would like to wrap up the QA and do book signing. Yes. So, um, let's have a round of applause one more time for. Yeah. Dr. Thank you all very much.